Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending. My name's Shrinand. I'm the Director of ESG and Sustainability here at Baker Tilly. Looking forward to talking to you all today um, about those, those, those impending risks that ESG is posing to the middle market, um, especially from a climate risk reporting point of view. Um, in terms of where we want to start today, um, if we if we could start with where are the pressures actually coming from? What 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 types of stakeholders are asking these questions? Um, and and start to unpack a bit more about what it is we could actually do about that. Um, if we could have the third slide on screen, I think that would be really useful for everyone watching. Great, thank you. Um, so to scene set for the day, what we're really talking about is environmental social governance. Um, I've personally been in this industry for a long time, Mallory, and I think you know that. And we've seen it really change from a checkbox issue to now, well, you've got to actually take serious action. So we've kind of identified where those pressures are coming from, and there's five major, major categories. But the question I really want to pose to you, Mallory, is living and breathing in that risk space every day, what are you hearing from your clients and what the middle market is saying as to how they're responding to ESG as a risk and how they're preparing for it? Yeah, I think, Shanann, we're seeing a lot of different uh, reporting requests from vendors or even within CDP. Obviously, there's a lot of forthcoming regulation that's coming from the SEC. While these clients may not be public companies, they may be within the value stream of those companies. So having to report some of their uh, greenhouse gas emission and data or specific metrics um, that organizations are requesting from these companies. So I think there's a lot of different pressures that we're seeing. This may be just externally um, from the vendors that they work with, internally from some of their employees requesting this information. Um, I think there's a lot of different risks we're seeing and just the evolution of how do you incorporate climate related risks, understand the risk areas, and then build upon that within your risk management processes. So creating that overall holistic lens of risk within an organization is, is really what we're seeing a lot of our organizations and companies that we work with trying to execute currently. So are you seeing that companies now are looking at this more from a reputational risk as opposed to just a PR issue? Yeah, I think it's a reputational risk, um, especially if there's any commitments or goals, right? So mm -hmm. some of the organizations we work with may have specific goals that they've set. Um, and if they can't meet those goals, that poses a significant reputational risk. So really advising our clients on thinking through what their strategy is, how they're going to get there if they are setting goals and targets and providing that reporting and on progress that they're making, I think is really important. Um, creating some of that transparency with their stakeholders around, here's our goals, this is where we wanna go, but also this is how we're gonna get there and this is what we've done to date. So I think it's really important from a reputational perspective that those goals and targets are realistic and they can achieve them. Um, I know a lot of our clients, obviously there's the regulatory piece and compliance piece of this that's important, but I think there's other areas too. I mean, curious your thoughts, Shrinand, on some of the more strategic areas that you've seen with some clients. Yeah, I mean, where do you start with the strategic piece on when we begin with ESG? It's such a, such a minefield in the landscape. And when you've not done stuff in that previously, well, um, what does it actually mean? So when we take a step back and we look at who's actually asking those, those questions, that's what's going to drive our focus and our impact going forward. Um, we've seen in, in investors increasingly start to ask questions and we'll dive into that a bit more on the next slide. But then you've also got the regulatory piece, which is where you predominantly live and breathe um, in, in, that, in that risk world, which is really transforming ESG from a nice to have to a must have. And then we've got the traditional sets of community groups that really want to see product service value from what companies and organisations actually do within those within those communities and then employees and customers, you know, having that equal effect as an organization, you can't survive without your employees or your customers. So how does ESG actually lend itself to 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 alleviating those risks is the real question. If we flick to the next slide, what I'm seeing in in the um in the bulk of 
of the work we're doing and in the bulk of what my client contacts are actually saying is ESG and and the impacts of ESG are manifesting across the four across these four diff, different areas. So, firstly, every organisation needs to be able to reduce their operating costs at some level, especially now talking about inflation and the, and the rising cost of operating. Simple things like energy efficiency measures they fall under the ESG bucket, and you know, doing those, it's it's not it's. It's almost just operational sense at this point. It's not It's not just ESG, right? Um, a large part of where we focus and where the middle market has a bit of a blind spot is around managing impending risks through that, through that regulation, um, understanding how to maintain competitive edges and how to stay competitive in the face of the transparency obligations coming down the pathway. The, the third piece here is where it gets really interesting and where I, I actually love this this type of stuff. Mm-hmm. You look at the work you do, what organisations do to set themselves up really nicely, and then the piece goes missing as to how that actually generates value for the organisation. Um, the one example I'll look at here is plant-based food. Right, we've over the last ten years, and I've been in this industry for fifteen odd years, so I, I've got experience in it, but I'm still a relative newbie in 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 this in every sense of the word and what i've seen in the last 10 years is this rise of you know veganism and that's transferred into plant-based food now why has that a, a, a why, why why has that come up because we're talking about a loss of biodiversity becoming more mainstream in the consciousness of communities customers and employees we're talking about ability to develop new products that will engage uh, new revenue streams for companies And then we're also talking about potential carbon benefit down the road once the supply chain actually reacts to the products that are meeting the needs of consumers and all the other stakeholders. So that's the crux of what ESG actually means in terms of creating value is how do you use it to identify new products, new new, new revenue streams that have that combined benefit across whatever ESG factors it might be, whether it's carbon, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's social inclusion, whether it's whether it's to um, equitable resource access, whatever it might be, and then the last one here, and Mallory, we all have this problem when you're running a business, when you're doing anything, attracting and retaining talent. You probably know this better than I, but being able to find people, invest time into them, if they don't believe in the purpose of your organisation, mm-hmm. not going to stick around, and that is a major cost to an organisation. Having to replace staff, find that 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 information drain going out of an organization is a really difficult thing to make up now ESG when we talk about how what what, what does that specifically mean uh, for for various companies we're talking there was a recent Harvard Business Review article I believe that that spoke to 87 percent of the of this gen generation's graduates in building ESG factors into decision-making as to where they go after school um, and being able to feel that positivity and pride and, co- and connectivity with the purpose of an organisation. It's not a soft thing anymore. It's a real tangible value. Um, but really, that's, that's, that's how I see uh, it, all, it all manifesting. And, you know, we can, we can talk about who's putting the pressure, what, what re- regulations there, but this is the real impact. This is the crux of what we're seeing day to day as the value and the reasons behind acting. Um, so I've spoken a lot there and I've <laughs> thrown a lot out there. I would urge people, and I think we're seeing a couple of questions come through at the minute. Um, Mallory, we've got, I, I think we should define this one before we move on. Can you give us a definition of what the middle market is in the ESG context? Yeah. So when we think about middle market, we're thinking about, you know, it could be public companies, smaller public companies, private companies, nonprofit organizations, you know, not that fortune 100 company, but really those those mid-sized organizations and a variety of companies fall into that a kind of a mid market that we define. So you probably are a characteristic of that um, as we kind of talk through the different challenges that we see within ESG. 
Yeah. I think one of the things too that's really important, Shanann, that you highlighted is just that this is more than just, and I know I live in the world of risk, but it's more than just managing risk and being able to really realize the, the reduced costs and the benefits of being able to implement a, an ESG program effectively within your organization can have so much benefit. And I think that's an important aspect of this instead of just doing the compliance exercise risk management there's really a lot of benefit revenue generation value creation through mm -hmm. these initiatives as well yeah yeah and i just want to address that next question that that came in before we move on on the slides we're talking about an esg backlash and what our clients are saying in the marketplace um from my personal view of this mallory I've always seen this as, well, we don't talk about ESG from a negative sense. We don't expect clients to do things that don't have a business benefit. So what we like to do and how we position this is ESG is a core benefit to your business from a mm -hmm. financial aspect and tie every ESG move back to a profit and loss benefit. Um, when we look, we've had clients that don't really understand this and we have to bring them around through a various level of education and meeting them where they're at and what their specific needs are it's for us it's correct me if i'm wrong mallory it's a real education journey for us especially right. when we have companies in their infancy in this in this model um you know how do we how do we educate them how do we give them oh that's how, sorry how do, how do we get them away from thinking oh, that's just something that's a compliance issue and I don't have to look at it, I don't have to integrate it. What what we do, well, how do, Mike, my, my question to you, Mallory, is how do we then transform that conversation into one of ESG growth across a broader journey? Yeah, I, and we can go to the next slide where we kind of talk about the different strategy evolutions because I think that's key is the first step is making sure that there's alignment. Obviously, ESG initiatives are going to look different at every organization based on their mission, vision, values, and overall strategic priorities. So what they prioritize or what they do in this space is really up to that leadership function and making sure that there's alignment to begin with. Um, obviously, organizations that are probably doing a lot of these different activities, they may not be coined as ESG or sustainability, but it's really understanding what you are currently doing and, and where you want to go in the next um, phase or as you enhance your ESG initiatives and program across the organization. As we, and we really start with that education session, like you mentioned, Shernand. I think that's really key is making sure your stakeholders understand what you plan to do, where you want to go, and there's alignment and buy-in across the organization because it's really key in initiating this process with your stakeholders for that education session, level setting on what this means, how you're going to incorporate it across the organization is really yeah. important aspect in that initial phase. Um, and then we think about like the developmental phase is really embedding this within your risk management processes. So thinking about your enterprise risks, how does ESG relate to these risk areas? How are you managing those risks or, or mitigating those risks overall within your organization? And then the overall governance process. So incorporating ESG related risks into your risk management processes, your steering committees, evaluating risk ongoing throughout the organization. Um, and then really operationally, you move to more of that production of an ESG related report, which may be public. So you may disclose that publicly on a website or maybe it's through CDP reporting, um, but you're really identifying and reporting your risks potentially your greenhouse gas emissions as a part of that, and then maybe even developing some goals and metrics. Um, as you think about where you want to be, uh, you're going to probably create what you need to do to get there. And I think that's an important aspect that a lot of clients sometimes, you know, there may be lofty goals that are thrown out, but they aren't thinking about the tactical execution to get to those goals. So that's an aspect that we've really seen, I think, with a few clients is really being realistic on where to start and how do they build their program. And then transformationally, obviously, you know, we've done a lot of assurance over ESG related data um, or sustainability reports. And I think that's an important and evolving space uh, as organizations start to produce these reports, having some verification over those data sources uh, mm -hmm. provides more comparability and verifiability in the market and people can trust that information. Similar to financial statements, you think about 
companies produce financial statements, they're audited. Um, and it's kind of a similar aspect. Would you put out statistics and information without having that verification, I think is an important piece to consider. Great. Um, so oh, let's yes, just level. Oh, yeah, sorry. I think there's another question there. Um, as ESG is an, is under implemented stage, so ESG is under implemented stage. How, let me try and paraphrase this question. As ESG is in an under implemented stage, how is it regulated and policy documented? So if we're talking about the regulatory landscape of ESG. What we're seeing is a real shift and the European markets leading that. They, they have always been the leaders on ESG regulation. But the understanding with any ESG regulation coming in is that there's an adoption period. Um, so across Europe, those, those mandated ESG reporting structures, I'm going to throw some acronyms at you here, um, CSRD, SFDR, they're all well currently active with certain organisations that are qualifying needing to report them this year. Whereas the SEC hopefully will finalise their rules you know, in October this year. And then there's a 12 month onboarding period for that particular reporting structure. What we're saying here, and Mallory, correct me if I'm wrong, what we're saying here is for the middle market, because they're kind of blindsided because they're not publicly listed, when this requirement gets cascaded down, mm -hmm. they make up the bulk of the sort of supply chain for, private, for publicly held companies, um, you need to be prepared. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to maintain that level of involvement, those contracts. It will be a, it's it's a clear and present P and L risk. Agree, and I think there's various, obviously, compliance regulations based on your industry where you're at, um, from a public company perspective or operations internationally in the EU. There's different things that would apply from a regulation perspective. So I think each organization is a little bit unique yeah. in evaluating that landscape. Yeah, I, I tend to think of it as the calm before the storm because, <laughs> I mean, everyone has a plan until it punches you in the face. And when ESG regulation punches you in the face, it's going to be too late if you're not prepared, at least in the very initial steps. Um, yeah. So, and that's what we talk to our clients about, you know. Um, so should we move to a polling question? I think we've got our first one here. And this question asks, how would you classify your organization's ESG and sustainability maturity? I think this might help inform some of the discussion here too. Um, initial, developmental, operational, transformational, or not certain. And two, please feel free to continue to put questions in the Q&A. Um, if we don't, if we run out of time, um, please include your name so we can follow up with you as well. If we don't get to all the questions. Yeah, that's generally my fault if we don't have enough time. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mallory, do, do you do you want to run us through where yeah. people should start on their ESG journey? Let's let's talk about the very basic steps going forward. Yeah. So I think we're, we talked about the pressures. Um, there's actually a recent report in CFO uh, 2023 Q2 Outlook report. And it mentioned that nearly 94% of executives surveyed said they strongly or somewhat agree that they feel external pressure to prioritize ESG initiatives at their companies. So there's pressure to prioritize these initiatives. I think the first step here that's most important is understanding that there's a lot of things that you're probably doing at your organization that are ESG related. Um, a lot of this could be around some of the different ethic programs you have. You likely have uh, employee ethics policies that are in place from a governance perspective. Uh, you may incorporate different giving programs in your local community or volunteering as, a, as an organization within your local community. You may practice different cybersecurity assessments and have uh, different controls around that as well, mm. or supplier conducts. Um, how do you work with suppliers and, and have that process implemented? So I think the takeaway here is that there's likely things you're doing from an ESG perspective of your organization. So don't think that this is a whole new thing you have to go do. It's, I think it's really evaluating where is your current state as that first step, which is most important. And then from there, build on what is your plan for the future. Yeah. I guess the only thing I'd add to that is it's really important to understand what's material for your organization. Yeah. You can talk about ESG in such a broad landscape and there's so many things you could do. And that's why people get lost 
Whereas if you can narrow that down to who are your customers, who are the communities mm-hmm. you actually operate in, what are your people saying is is valuable and important to them that you take action on? The thing here is ESG is a journey and an ESG strategy, a good one, is really targeted. No one's expecting a mining company to be to be to be really good at something that's not related to social impacts of of let's say fashion, right? It's completely different. Um, you're talking about what's relevant and core to your business and the impacts. Um, I think that's 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 a message that's often lost because often we'll we we hear about a client that needs an ESG need because they have a survey that they're being asked to go yeah. do and. <laughs> You know, we're kind of playing catch up. Whereas if you're in the position where you're looking to take the first step, just find out what's important um, and go from there. We got a lot of questions coming in. Um, First one here is what percentage of your middle market client base are under that initial developmental stage, would you say? That's that's interesting because we've had some good recent conversations that aren't at this stage, right? Um, I know, I'd probably say 60 or 70. Agreed, yeah. There's a, there's a little bit of an understanding. Someone's heard something about an EcoVartis survey or a CDP questionnaire, but no one's um, no one's actively going after a strategy or anything like that. And, and the first step is just having the conversation with someone who knows the staff and then understanding what's important. What's that second question? Politics, here we go. Yeah. Love this one. Comes under community and managing risks. How do you not shake up this political hornet's nest? Um Thank you, MJS at SLP. Right, that's an interesting one. We don't engage in the political conversation about ESG because we relate everything from ESG back into dollars and cents. Um, we're not really interested in getting split down that down down that line because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which way you lean. If something is a direct material threat to your ability to conduct business then it matters to your core business to actually address it. It matters to your people, it matters to your constituents, it matters to your customers that you address it to actually be able to provide that service and product and those jobs and all, all that all that, all that, that type of wonderful stuff that we all love. Um, so, and I don't know, I, I think you've heard this before, Mallory. I always look at this pushback as like, when an artist released a new song, right, there's always 20% of the world that is going to hate it gonna absolutely hate it just because of who they are but they'll get stuck into the marketing that's based around that music <laughs> they'll get stuck into to, to every little bit of you know social media that is around it because they can't avoid it that's what ESG is there's always going to be a portion of the world that hates it regardless of the benefits it provides because they probably misunderstand it um, yeah. and that's and that's that's what I feel our role is here is if we have a political naysayer in our midst and and they they want to talk about that. Well, it's our job to convince them that it's not a political issue; it's a financial issue, it's an economic right. issue. Yep, definitely. There's another question around the CSRD, ask double materiality, um, right. and thinking about those different challenges and opportunities when updating to the newly released guidance and directive under the CSRD. Mm-hmm. Curious, any thoughts on that approach? Yeah, so there's a lot of challenges there and it generally relates to scope three because that's what double materiality covers. What's helping is the ESRS guidelines on what to actually report and they're mm-hmm. slowly being released. I think with the CSRD, there was a bit more of a understanding that this is going to be ameliorated and it's going to be crafted over time. So there is a bit more acceptance of um, not inaccurate re- reporting but incomplete reporting with best efforts put forward. Um, and over time, I mean, you can have all the frameworks you want. If you don't have the guidance on what to actually report, you're not going to get the right thing. And really, when you're talking about double materiality, it's it's making sure you're not going too far into the weeds and sticking to what is actual actually material at that particular level. Do you go, how many layers deep do you actually peel back that onion? Um, and what types of impacts are you actually covering? Um so it's a it's a good question. It's a really good question. But then again, at, at the basis of it, it's a matter of being started. It's sorry, it's a, it's a matter of having a baseline ability to actually start reporting on these things. Yeah, and your impact and understanding the materiality piece as well. Yeah. And I think it'll be interesting with SEC 
um, and, and how this all aligns with a different focus from a materiality perspective. Um, and companies having to report that in the U.S. that could look a little bit different. Just mindful right. of time. Should we yes. should we flick to the uh, to the to the to the next polling question? Yeah, let's do that because I think we'll incorporate some of those aspects on the next slide. Yeah, I think we'd rather hear from the people than they hear from us. <laughs> So this question, can your organization internally support your ESG efforts? So curious to hear thoughts on that. I think, you know, we've had a lot of different conversations with clients and it's interesting to see where this uh, responsibility lies within an organization. Sometimes it's in finance, sometimes it's marketing, sometimes we're even seeing internal audit having the responsibility of some ESG reporting as well. So curious how your organization looks to internally support this. All right. Great. Well, I think we're nearing the end here. So why don't we just take two seconds and just recap what we've spoken about here because there's a lot. So in order to level set, we understand ESG is a risk coming from a large number of stakeholders and it impacts businesses in many, many different ways, but really speaks to the financial crux of your viability as a business, as an organisation and the impact you have beyond that. We, are, we understand it's a journey. It's an absolute journey and it's not one where, you know, Mallory, I know you're not sitting there trying to poke holes in organisations saying you're not doing this. We just try as, as ESG professionals to inform, educate and progress that ESG capability so we can protect and enhance your business. That's exactly what our role is and that's exactly what anyone who's talking about ESG, in my opinion, that's what their role should should, should be. So it looks like we're going to need a part two. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, so this was, I think we had a lot of great questions today. If you have more questions, please continue to put them in the chat, put your name and we'll follow up with you. Um, I think that it's, you know, there's some great resources we have on our website, different um, regulatory requirements and guidance on assessing your organization, understanding how to kind of get started on this journey and what that looks like for you. Feel free to check those out. Always feel free to connect out to to uh, reach out to myself and Trinand. Uh, we'd love to chat more around your journey and where you're looking to go and uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks everyone. Appreciate it.